Well, thanks, Brother David, and good evening, everybody. Uh, the reading of Acts 6 and our consideration of Acts 7 is no mistake. Uh, Acts 7 is our reading for the day. Um, and uh, I, I, I appreciated that Acts 7 is quite a long chapter for us to read. Uh, I think we're fairly familiar with Acts 7. Uh, and I thought, therefore, we'd better establish the immediate context to Acts chapter 7 as we then expound uh, Acts 7 this evening. Um, now, I've shared an awful lot of material this evening. That said, we'll still be going fairly quickly. Um, so, uh, try to keep up, please. Um, so, the objectives for this evening. Uh, we're going to outline the, the immediate context of Acts 6, as we've suggested. We'll then consider the structure, the structure and the content of Acts chapter 7. Uh, and then we'll spend a little bit of time answering uh, a couple of the apparent contradictions <laughs> Uh, that are in Acts chapter 7. So, Acts chapter 6. Now, I want you to note that we're told in Acts chapter 4 and verse 4 that the number of the men of Jerusalem, the number of the men of the Jerusalem Ecclesia uh, was about 5,000. Uh, Acts 4 verse 4, the number of the men was about 5,000. Acts 5 verse 14 tells us that to that 5,000, Believers were more added to the Lord, multitudes, both of men and women. And it's from that vast number of brothers in Christ that in uh, Acts chapter 6 and verse 3, we are told that just seven brethren are chosen. Men who met the criteria that was laid down by the apostles. Acts 6 and verse 3, wherefore, brethren, look out. Look you out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, who we may appoint over this business. Now of that seven, it would appear that Stephen was first among them. Verse 5 of Acts 6, and the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and then the six, other, six others. And... To reinforce that point that Stephen appears to be first among those seven, we have in verse 8 uh, recorded uh, a little bit about what the Spirit Word has chosen to reveal of these seven. Of the six, I suggest we know next to nothing other than their excellent character that stands out amongst the, the thousands that could have been chosen of that ecclesia. And yet of those seven, the, the Spirit Word chooses to record a little bit about Stephen and we had that in verse 8 of Acts chapter 6 and Stephen full of faith and power did great wonders and miracles among the people then there arose certain of the synagogue which is called the synagogue of the Libertines and Cyrenians and, and Alexandrians and of them of Cilicia and of Asia disputing with Stephen and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Now we sometimes, perhaps some of us might think that Acts chapter 7 is the only uh, recorded defence um, of, of Stephen, of, of the gospel. But whilst that is the case, uh, Acts chapter 6 I think implies that there were many occasions, as we've just read in verses 8 to 10, uh, that Stephen resists those Judaizers of that Jerusalem uh, ecclesia. Uh, there are many occasions when Stephen defended the faith when it was challenged, when it was under fire. And it, uh, we only have the, the detailed account in Acts chapter 7, but it therefore comes on the back of these other defences we suggest. The three words in verse 10 that I'd like you to notice, please, are the words resist... The word wisdom and the word spirit or the spirit by which he spake. And I think these are really important. My margin takes us to two passages from the Gospels and I'd like to look at both of them very briefly. Uh, in reverse order to, as they are in the margin. So Luke 21 please first. Uh, do keep a marker in Acts 7 if you haven't. That's a bit late but you can put one there when we're, we're next there. Luke 21. Uh, and verse 12. And this is in the context of the Olivet prophecy. And Christ is saying before the days of AD 70. 
these things are going to happen. Luke 21 and verse 12. Before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues. That's what we're told of Acts 6. Of the synagogues and into prisons being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. And it shall turn to you for a testimony. Settle it therefore in your hearts not to meditate before what ye shall answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. So in the Olivet Prophecy they're told that when you are delivered up for persecution and in the synagogues, don't think about what you've got to say because you will be given the words and you'll be given wisdom and you won't be able to resist, they won't be able to resist it. That's what we're told in Acts 6, isn't it? Verse 10, they could not resist the wisdom by which he spake. So Acts 7, we're already going to suggest, isn't Stephen's words. It's not even an accurate record of what Stephen said. It's God's words in the mouth of Stephen. And to reinforce that point, Matthew chapter 10, please. A different occasion, not in the context of the Olivet Prophecy, but pertaining to the same thing we suggest. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 17. Matthew 10, verse 17, But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues. And ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you, take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak, for it is not ye that speak, but the spirit of your father which speaketh in you. They could not resist the spirit, the, the wisdom and the spirit by which Stephen spoke, says Acts 6 and verse 10. So what we have, we suggest in Acts chapter 7, is an accurate record of the inspired word in the mouth of Stephen. Now before we leave Acts chapter 6 behind entirely, we'd like to notice the, uh, the false accusations that are made against uh, Stephen. Uh, he's accused, falsely accused, of blasphemy against Moses and God in verse 11. And he's falsely accused of blasphemy against the holy place and the law in verse 13. So we then come into chapter 7. With those two false accusations in mind, we're now going to tackle Acts chapter 7. Now at this point, I want to just uh, point out that at the top of some of our Bibles, or if not most of our Bibles, we have in italics, uh, the words of the translators, Stephen's apology. Uh, and uh, we just want to highlight uh, that Stephen hasn't got anything to apologise about. Uh, it's not as if he's sorry for anything. The word apology in this sense is a legal term from the Greek apolo apologia, uh, meaning uh, a reasoned defence, or apologia. Uh, logi, logis, uh, we get logic. Um, there's many words that have uh, the Greek word logic in them. So uh, it's that reasoned defence. So that's just uh, what, why that's there, uh, perhaps. Uh, that may be new to, to a few of you. Now when we're presented with a long section of scripture like Acts chapter 7, um, a good place to start is to try and establish uh, the structure of the account. We try to um, uh, work out where the emphasis of the passage lies. And we do this because it is no ordinary account. As we've already established, it's the inspired word of God. Now we are keen therefore to see how God has structured his word and to see where God has chosen to place, place the emphasis, particularly in large sections. Um, and we can be certain, can't we, that no words of scripture are ever wasted. Now we appreciate that the chapter divisions themselves and the verse divisions are not inspired. Uh, they are merely a device of the translators to help us navigate our way through the text. A very useful device, it has to be said. Uh, but they are not inspired. And as careful Bible readers, we start by looking for things like keywords, uh, repeated themes, 
quoted sections from other parts of the scriptures which can give us a context, a frame of reference uh, for the passage we're considering. Uh, and also we look for uh, structure that's within the text itself. So in the Psalms we're familiar with so-called poetic structure, aren't we? Things like alphabetic acrostics uh, that Brother Mike has brought out uh, on, on occasions. Um, and sometimes just ordinary acrostics, so there's fewer of those we think. Um, now I labour this point because I believe that in Acts chapter 7 God uses two very important chiastic structures in his revealed word. Now I confess that the word chiasm uh, was new on my radar uh, only about 12 months ago at Bible school last year uh, and I've only really appreciated uh, the enormity of them in scripture in the last uh, three or four months. Um, so I want to just explain to you what a chiasm is uh, and, and how we find them and then we'll look at how useful they are once we've found them. Now bear with me, this isn't just an academic exercise, we've already established this is the inspired word of God speaking in the mouth of Stephen. So we are suggesting straight away that the structure to the account is also of God. Now the word chiasm uh, you won't find it in the Bible. It is a 17th century term and is derived from uh, the Greek letter uh, chi and it's there on, on large form on the screen for you. It's an X in our alphabet. Um, and the ends of the lines um, represent... Uh, that wasn't me, definitely wasn't me. Uh, uh, related uh, ideas, so linked ideas. So if we were to read... Uh, left to right, from top to bottom, we'd have A, B, B, A, and the mirrored pairs then uh, appear. And we've got one uh, very quick example there on the screen for you to try and get you to grasp the idea quite quickly. Uh, Matthew 20, verse 16, so the first shall be last, and the last first. Uh, and so we see that the ideas of uh, A are, are linked, and, and the ideas of B are, are also linked. Um, and as we go through scripture, we'll start to find these more and more. Uh, in fact, they're normally a lot longer than the first example from Matthew 20. They're normally in the form uh, at the bottom here. So you'll have A, B, C to D, which is the pivotal clause, and then it reverses back out. So it mirrors back out. So C, B, and A. And the wonderful usefulness of this is in large sections of scripture where you find them, God is placing emphasis, we suggest, on the pivotal point where D would occur on that example at the bottom, the central theme by way of emphasis. Now, I'm now going to put up the first chiasm. This isn't to baffle you, I want to bring you with me, so we'll take a little bit of time on this, but hopefully you'll be as enthused and as, ma as amazed as I was uh, when I found this in Acts chapter 7. Now, I've used this software because we can zoom it in, but before we zoom it in, you'll see that we've got a, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, to a central point, I, and then it reverses back out. And the colour coding is to suggest uh, the points of those lines where the, the themes come. So we'll now take those pairs in turn as we work towards the central theme. So this chiasm, it starts, uh, we think, in Acts 7 verse 20. Speaking of Moses, now before we go too much further, let me just remind you, because we've just baffled ourselves with chiasms, haven't we? These are the false accusations. The first one is against Moses and against God. And the first chiasm, we believe, answers that point directly. So, point A, we've highlighted there in yellow that Moses was born and exceeding fair and nourished up in his father's house... And we're told that Pharaoh's daughter then took him up. Uh, and the word Anna is the prefix in Greek for both of those highlighted expressions. And it's the idea of being brought up. And we are suggesting that's mirrored with uh, the bottom clause here in verse 37. If anybody can read that, read that I don't know. Uh, but the, I'll, I'll bring it even larger. The prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren. So this is Moses being brought up. And as we work inwards now, we'll stay at the bottom, we're told that they, Israel wandered in the wilderness 40 years, verse 36, and we're told uh, that when Moses was a full 40 years old in verse 23, that he came to the children of Israel. 
and he supposed that they would understand that God, by his hand, would deliver them. And there in the pink at the bottom, we have that is sent to be a ruler and to deliver by the hand of the angel which appeared unto him in the bush. So it's a related idea. And then we have twice repeated, who made thee a ruler and judge, verse 35 and verse 27. We have Egypt emphasised in verse 28 and verse 34. We have the land or the ground emphasised in verse 29 and verse 33. Uh, and then as we get in towards the pivotal point here, we have um, the angel of the Lord speaking to Moses when Moses couldn't uh, draw near to the bush to behold its burning, uh, repeated in verse 31 and verse 32, and then it pivots round this central theme, that the voice of the Lord came unto Moses saying, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now what was the accusation against, uh, against uh, Stephen? Well, that he blasphemed against Moses and God. And the whole of that chiasm structure that we've just briefly gone through focuses on the work of God through Moses and socks it to them right in the middle there that it was the voice, not only of, of any God, but the name-bearing angel saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now, before we get sort of to see how important that central phrase is, uh, how do we find these for ourselves? Well, the bits you spot are when, curiously, we have <coughs> repeated ideas close together. When Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight, and as he drew near to behold it, the voice of the Lord came unto him, saying, Then Moses trembled and durst not behold it. So when we get that very quick, close succession, repeated themes, just think to yourself, there might be a chiastic structure here, and then work backwards, work outwards, to see how far it goes, and what's the point that's being drawn out for us? So to recap so far, we, we're excited because this is the word of God in the mouth of Stephen. And we're suggesting that beyond that, the structure itself is of God. Focusing our mind in on that key phrase that occurs in verse 31 and 32. The voice of the Lord came unto Moses saying, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. So with the false accusation in mind that Stephen had blasphemed against Moses and against God, let's just consider for a moment just how important that central expression is to the theme uh, of Acts chapter 7. I'd like us please to keep a marker in Acts chapter 7 and go back to Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3 is where that central point that we've highlighted in black is being directly quoted from. It's the first occurrence of this uh, expression. Uh, it's the incident of the burning bush. Exodus 3 and verse 5, please. And the angels, or the voice said unto Moses in verse 5, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And Exodus chapter 3 continues in verse 13. Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. And God said moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, Yahweh Elohim of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. A Jewish audience in Acts chapter 7, this would have been ringing in their ears. God here in Exodus chapter 3 does two things. He establishes his name by which he is to be known. I am. And then immediately in verse 14 associates his memorial title by which he is to be remembered. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. 
That's God's name and that's God's full title. God has many titles, but this is right up there, ranks as one of the highest associated directly with his name. And it's used, as we know, uh, through scripture to, to prove the preeminence of God. Uh, just two examples, um, please. 1 Kings 18. We're not going back to Exodus 3, uh, so uh, we don't have to keep too many markers. 1 Kings 18, please. Let's just notice how important this phrase is and why we don't believe that what's on the screen is any form of a coincidence. 1 Kings 18 and verse 36. This is when Elijah believed, wrongly, that he was the only man alive that would worship God before God had told him, of course, that there were 7,000 that had not bowed the knee to Baal. And he prays, doesn't he, on Mount Carmel, 1 Kings 18 and verse 36. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Yahweh, God of Abraham, Isaac and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel and that I am thy servant and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Yahweh, hear me, that this people may know that thou art Yahweh God and thou hast turned their heart back again. And we know that once the fire had consumed the offering, that the people fall on their faces in verse 39. Yahweh, he is God, or Eliyah, a play on Elijah's own name. That they would know that Yahweh is God. And above that, that his name is Yahweh. And that he is the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Israel. The second of the two examples, please, 1 Chronicles 29. Um, 1 Chronicles 29 and uh, verse 18, please. Just before David's death, when Solomon is going to be taking over uh, from David, we have the words of David recorded um, in 1 Chronicles 29, verse 18. Uh, he prays, doesn't he? O Yahweh, God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, our fathers, keep this forever in the imagination of the, the thoughts of the heart of thy people, and prepare their heart unto thee. And give unto Solomon, my son, a perfect heart, to keep thy commandments, and thy testimonies, and thy statutes, and to do all these things, and to build the palace for the which I have made provision. And David said to all the congregation, Now bless Yahweh your God. And all the congregation blessed Yahweh, God of their fathers, and bowed their heads and worshipped Yahweh and the king. And we know, don't we, that this idea of God being the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob being picked up in the New Testament by the Lord Jesus Christ himself uh, to prove that there is going to be a resurrection from the dead of the faithful. Matthew 21, if you're minded to, to turn there. Matthew 21 and um, verse 31. That could be 12 actually. I have a wrong reference written down. 22, thank you. It is. Thank you, Tim. Uh, Matthew 22, verse 31. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have ye not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. The point was that he is still their God. So the fathers must stand again. They must rise from the dead to see the fulfillment of the promises that were made so long ago. So that's God's name, Yahweh, and that's the title by which he was to be known in all generations because he will fulfill his perfect. His name is in the imperfect tense. It hasn't been accomplished. It has yet to be fulfilled. And this idea then is picked up by the apostles in Acts 7, yes, but first in Acts chapter 3, uh, verse 13, uh, the apostle Peter says... 
Acts 3.13, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. And again then in the mouth of Stephen, as we've seen in Acts 7 and verse 32. So it's wonderful with that whistle-stop tour to see that that very phrase, which we think is at the centre of this first piece of the structure of the account, is linked to Moses. It was revealed directly to Moses so long ago. God said, this is my name, this is the way I want to be known, and this is the title by which he shall declare. And it is picked up by the faithful through the pages of the scripture, and is proved, used again to prove the resurrection from the dead, part of the fulfilment of God's purpose with mankind. And it lies at the centre of this structure. And why, we ask, why not just the God of Abraham? Why Isaac and Jacob? Well, the reason is, of course, because Abraham, Isaac and Jacob each uh, represent different aspects of the purpose of God. Abraham, we're told in Romans 4 verse 16, is, is the father of us all. Isaac, we are told very clearly in scripture, is the son. He stands as a type of the Lord Jesus Christ, doesn't he? He was to be offered the only son of his father. And God spared him, as we know. And Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, represents the multitude of the descendants. And we're told in Romans 11, verse 28, And so all Israel shall be saved, both Jew and Gentile. And so we have it, don't we? The Father, the Son, and the multitude. So how pertinent to this false accusation is it to build towards this key phrase in Acts chapter 7? To prove unequivocally that far from blaspheming Moses and God, he understood exactly and the spirit revealed through him that God worked through Moses to establish his purpose. Isn't that, I think it's just remarkably exciting and if you can't see all of that perhaps we'll uh, take some notes afterwards and I can talk you through it some more. But as a structure, it's quite simple to understand. Perhaps finding them is another aspect, but hopefully that just illustrates, first of all, the, the use of them, because we don't now need to go looking for where the emphasis in the passage is or try to work it out for ourselves. It's, it's there for us to find. And if we're in any doubt that God is at the centre of Acts chapter 7, we've got his title there, as we've laboured in Acts 7 verse 32, but just note now briefly in Acts chapter 7 how God is the focus of the whole chapter of Stephen's defence. Verse 2 of Acts 7. Stephen said, Men and brethren and fathers, hearken. The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham. This God of glory, verse 3, said unto him, Get thee out. And note, come into the land which I have shown thee. A bit like Noah was told to come into the ark. So too, Abraham was told to come into the land that he was to be shown. And it's still God in verse 4. When his father was dead, he removed him from this land. God removed uh, Abraham from the land. God, verse 5, gave him none inheritance in it. Verse 6, God spake on this wise. Verse 7, there shall be in bondage uh, to that nation I will judge, said God. Verse 9, Joseph was sold into Egypt, but God was with him. In verse 17, the time drew nigh which God had sworn to Abraham. Verse 25, God by his hand would deliver them. Verse 32, the title of God. Verse 35, God sent Moses to be a ruler. Verse 42, God turned and gave them to worship the host of heaven. Verse 45, God drove out the Gentiles from the face of our fathers. Verse 46, they found favour before God, desired to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob. Verse 48, howbeit the most high dwelleth not in temples. Verse 49, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What house will ye build me, saith God? We can't escape it once we've found it. And that's how useful this structure can be once we've read very carefully and picked up the emphasis that God has chosen to hone in on. And when we've established it in scripture, we can fit it back into the chapter and it makes abundant sense, perfect sense, and is incredibly useful to our understanding. How true then 
the words of our master in John 4, that he said, we know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. Just before we leave this idea uh, and move on to the second part of the structure, uh, Hebrews 11, please, in verse 13. Talking of the seed of Abraham, uh, so Abraham sort of begins Hebrews 11 verse 8, goes through uh, to the seed of promise in verse 11 and verse 12. Uh, and then the multitude, verse 12, as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from which they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country that is in heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. I am the God of Abraham, the father, the God of Isaac, the son, and the God of the seed of Abraham, the God of Jacob. And God is not ashamed to be called their God. The word called there is used in the New Testament as surname. The apostles were surnamed, such and such. God is not ashamed to be surnamed their God. And the point was made recently uh, by Brother David Pierce, actually. Would he be ashamed to be called our God? He was not ashamed to be called their God. So that's... Uh, that first section and how wonderfully has the, uh, the false testimony been rebutted by the, the Spirit of God in the mouth of Stephen. Far from blaspheming Moses and God, the word upholds everything that God has revealed through Moses and to the generations that followed. So we suggested then that that first uh, section uh, highlights Acts 7.32 um, just two other references you might want to note down, we're going to skip them for time but uh, the whole purpose for Israel being in, bondage, be, in, being in bondage in Egypt of course was that uh, we're told in Psalm 106 verse 8 that his name might uh, be known, that his power might uh, be manifest nevertheless he saved them for his name's sake that he might make his mighty power known to them and of course in Romans 9 verse 17. For this same purpose have I raised thee up, said God to Pharaoh, that I might show my power in thee and that my name might be declared in all the earth. So in that context, how fitting that that's the focus of that section of Acts chapter 7. So then what is the second accusation? Well, it's that he blasphemed, they said, against the holy place and the law. Now, I believe that there is a second chiasm. It's probably equally as hard to see as the first. Um, this one is slightly different in that instead of having similar pairs, we have contrasting pairs. So we believe it starts in verse 36 and goes through to verse 58. And where we have that God brought them out, and showed them signs and wonders in the land of Egypt. God put, brought Israel out. That's contrasted sadly to the rejection of the Jews of Stephen's day. Like the stiff-necked and uh, failing hearts of the fathers of old that had rejected God all along, as Stephen had tes testified to, they cast Stephen out of the city, a contrast to the deliverance of God and the deliverance to death of Stephen. Um, we told that Moses was to be raised up and they would hear him, uh, but unlike, or you might actually say like Moses, they didn't all hear Moses, did they? They rejected Moses, some of those fathers. Um, and like those of old, then we're told in verse 57 that they stopped their ears to stop hearing the words of God through Stephen. And they ran upon Stephen with one accord. Uh, and we then have contrasted idolatry, don't we? We have... Uh, three sort of ideas, D, E and F, I've li li listed those on the screen and make it as big as I can. 
They made the calf the work of their own hands. They worshipped the host of heaven. Uh, and uh, as predicted by the prophets, uh, they would turn to idol worship and take up the tabernacle of, Mose of Molech. So the fathers would not obey and they turned to idolatry. And contrasted to that, God has said in verse 48 that he doesn't dwell in temples made with hands as saith his prophet he said my hands have made all these things um, ye stiff necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears you do resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did so again that mirroring of ideas uh, goes through it contrasts what's revealed and then as we get towards the center of it the fathers, we're told in verse 4, made a tabernacle of witness in the wilderness. The tabernacle, we're familiar with that. And that's related uh, to, uh, or compared to, in verses 45 to 47, the tabernacle of the God of Jacob, that Solomon built him the house. And then verse 45, which our fathers that came after brought in with, it says Jesus, but I'm sure we're all aware it should be Joshua, Yeshua, um, uh, brought him with uh, Joshua into the possession of the Gentiles whom God drove out before the face of our fathers. So again, if we were reading this for the first time and we were attuned to this idea of repeated ideas, we might read verse 45 and think, oh, our fathers appears twice, that's unnecessary. We'd be told off in English for that in our exams. Repetition, cross it out. But no, it's useful, isn't it? In this case, if this structure is apparent, then we work out and to see, oh, tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, oh, they made him a tabernacle. Uh, and actually, the, the, the temple that was built, the Solomon's temple, I don't believe was called a tabernacle. But it is here in Acts chapter 7 because of the association of the ideas. And you see then as we work out that that theme becomes established. So I'm not trying to, to say, wow, this, you know, I've only come across these in the last, this one, these two in the last two or three months. Um, uh, and I've only really come across the idea in the last 12 months. So I'm not trying to prove a point or anything like that. I'm trying to enthuse you to encourage you to look for them the same because in large sections of scripture they can, I believe, be incredibly useful. And uh, for those that want to, to try and find them and if you think you've found them, uh, see if you're right. There's a, a website maintained by uh, a group of brethren and there's many contributors actually, brethren and sisters, um, all of whom you'll know, the names are on there. Uh, so uh, that website is Chiasmus Exchange. So Chiasmus X, the letter X, change. Uh, and, and I suggest that if you're just doing your readings and you come across one and you think you found one, go on to there. They've probably already got it up there, uh, but maybe it's longer or shorter than yours and you can help uh, contribute to that, that idea. And they really do seem to be ever prevalent. And perhaps for those of, of these that they're new to you, uh, this will give you something else to look for when you're doing the readings. And then it does change the emphasis. Uh, the one that's changed for me most recently is the Passover, to realise that in the account of the Passover, it's the unleavened bread that's at the centre of that. Uh, and there's so much for us to think about uh, in that regard. It's, uh, it's what follows, isn't it, the deliverance. It's the feast of unleavened bread. So anyway, that's a tangent. We'll come back then to this theme. So, so why? Why is this important? Why is it that the centre of this second part of the structure is that the tabernacle of witness was taken through the wilderness and then brought into the land, not the promised land, not the land that was going to be the future inheritance of the fathers, but described here as the possession of the Gentiles. We suggest because we just need to remember the accusation, don't we? Blasphemy against this holy place. What holy place? Herod's temple. The... the the centre of Jewish worship or Judaizers of Stephen's day that they believed was a continuation of the tabernacle and Solomon's temple and the law. Well, the point was, well, if the law was so important for salvation and if the temple was so important to salvation, how is it that it wasn't always in the land and how is it wasn't always established, particularly not in Abraham's day? Abraham never saw the tabernacle. Abraham never lived by the law. And that's the point, isn't it? That it was only through God's deliverance that God brought them into the land of the Gentiles and established his law in that land as he had already promised to the fathers. Acts 7.32 again, isn't it? 
So let's just develop that theme briefly for a minute. We've got to speed up for time. Um, so the point is, I think, in this second part of the structure, the spirit word through Stephen shows the limitation both of the law and the tabernacle. They said you've blasphemed the law and the tabernacle. The spirit through Stephen says no. They were limited. And they were a shadow, to use the language of Hebrews 10, of something much greater to come. So how is that so? Well, the law and the tabernacle were not essential for acceptable worship. Why? The speech begins in verse 2, doesn't it? What we've found in this structure, well, it has to fit the context of the rest of the chapter. It can't be manufactured or just suit our own ends. It's got to be there for a purpose. So how does this develop through the chapter? Well, verse 2. God spoke to Abraham in the temple? No. In the land? No. In Ur of the Chaldees? God spoke to Abraham. Moses stood on holy ground at the temple? No. In the wilderness of Sinai, in the desert. And yet God said, this is holy ground, take your shoes off and I will commune with thee. And that's verse 33. Verse 44 to 45, we already uh, alluded to. The nation worshipped in a movable tabernacle in the wilderness and in the land that was the Gentiles. Because it was brought into the land of the Gentiles, it wasn't, the land wasn't uh, established as the land of Israel. God didn't drive out the peoples first, then decide to go and fetch the tabernacle from somewhere it waited. No, they walked into the land of the Gentiles with the tabernacle and then God delivered them into their hand. And so we see that, again, he's not blaspheming the temple and the law, the institutions that have become the things of the Jews. He's pointing out that they've been corrupted and that God had only put them there for the time then present, to use another fr phrase from the letter to the Hebrews. The law and the tabernacle, the law and the temple, the Jewish order, the Mosaic system was limited. They needed the fulfilment of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it was that Joshua led them into the land of the Gentiles, into the land of promise, centre to that structure that we have on the screen there. Why? Because out of Egypt, I am the God of your fathers, first part of the chapter, into the promised land, second part of the chapter, is the pattern that's established throughout all scripture for all believers, <coughs> Jew or Gentile. We've all come out of Egypt, we're told, in a figure. We've all passed through the, the Red Sea, the waters of baptism. And we're all on our pilgrimage to the promised land. The promised land is only a lifetime away. The second part of the structure of Acts chapter 7. So I hope I've at least conveyed some of that passion. That Acts chapter 7 is, is clearly divided by God. We've established it is the word of God. We can't doubt that. Uh, and the structure too is of God. Now I want to spend the last five minutes. I'm going to squeeze the clock. Um, uh, because we just want to highlight. It's worth highlighting that Acts chapter 7 is a bit of a go-to passage. For some that would... Uh, claim that the Bible can't be the word of God. This is one chapter that's full of examples. They claim five or six probably um, because there are apparent contradictions. And we want to just look at two of them uh, and to show that actually without too much work we can uh, find, the, uh, find the solution to the puzzles and actually learn some lessons from them. So uh, the two commonly raised questions are uh, who bought what from whom? So we're looking at the section from verse... 9, or, or particularly really uh, verses 15 and 16, um, about what was bought off whom by whom. Uh, and secondly, very briefly, verse 14, how many came out of Egypt? And we're going to take them together because we think they're linked. We think the answer to them uh, is, is linked. Now, very quickly, I just want you to notice in Acts 7, verses 9 to 16, that the, the subject of this short section, the highlighted phrase is the 11 brothers of Joseph. Verse 9, the patriarchs moved with envy, sold Joseph. So it's the 11 brothers, described there as the patriarchs, patriarch, to do with the word fathers. Verse 11, and the fathers found no substance, sub, substance in the land of Canaan. So that's the 11 brothers, isn't it? But when Jacob heard that the corn was in Egypt, verse 12, he sent our fathers first. So the 11 brothers went into Egypt to find corn. We know this to be true. And it's 
Then we get the interesting detail, isn't it? Verse 15, so Jacob went down into Egypt and died, he and our fathers, and were carried over into Shechem and laid in the sepulchre that Abraham bought for a sum of money of the sons of Emma, the father of Shechem. So the problem, the so-called problems in verse 16, simply put, um, did Abraham buy a cave of uh, Emma, the father of Shechem? Genesis 23, Abraham purchases a field of Machpelah from Ephron Hittite. Joshua 24, Jacob purchased a field from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem. There's no Abraham buying something off Shechem. So was it a mistake? Did Stephen get it wrapped around his ears? No, we don't think so. We believe, we're going to suggest, that this is an extra revelation that was not in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is silent as to whether Abraham bought a cave. But what's more remarkable than that is not that there's another cave that we didn't know about from the Old Testament, but did you know that the father's bones were carried out of Egypt into the land? Acts 7 seems to suggest so, because the subject of that section, as we've established, is the fathers. Just read that again. Jacob went down into Egypt and died, he and our fathers, that's the 11 brothers, and were carried over into Shechem. We know Joseph gave commandment concerning his bones. But did you know that the brothers did also? And how appropriate, because God was the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Israel. How appropriate then for the patriarchs also to be buried in the land. And how appropriate then that they'd need a cave to be buried in. And just so happens then, says the spirit word in Acts chapter 7 through Stephen, there's a third cave. Abraham bought it, and they're buried there. And we notice, don't we, that not interrupted at this point. They didn't say, ah, you got that wrong. Of course you didn't mean that. No, the, the flow continues. They didn't raise objection to that. So whilst it's new to us, because we're 2,000 years on from this period of time, it would appear that perhaps the Jews of Stephen's day it wasn't so new to them. They knew this to be the case. So finally then, what of the other apparent contradiction? Um, how many people came out of Egypt? Verse 14 of Acts 7 says that... Um, then sent Joseph and called his father Jacob to him and all his kindred, three score and fifteen souls. Now, the Old Testament clearly states in Genesis uh, 46 and in Deuteronomy, uh, I've not written this one down, I think it's 22, 10 to 20, is it? Thank you. Uh, that it was 70 that came out of Egypt. So the Old Testament is absolutely clear on this 70 came out of Egypt. So why is it that Stephen says that there are 75? Well, those who are baffled by this but want to have a quick explanation say, well, in the heat of the moment, Stephen was passionate, wasn't he? Uh, you know, he's, he's caught up in it and he's just slipped, slip of the tongue. He said 75, he meant 70, but it's understandable. But no, it can't be so, can it? This is a man that's full of the Holy Spirit, speaking with a mouth of wisdom that could not be resisted. His face, we're told, shone like an angel, just like Moses did, by the way. And yet he says here it's 75. And the solution we suggest is very simple. Um, it's depending on perspective. The two expressions we think are complementary. It depends upon your perspective. Uh, similar to how we can give two different degrees for the boiling point of water. 100 degrees centigrade or 212 Fahrenheit, looking to the older ones. It's still the boiling point of water. One's in centigrade, the other's in Fahrenheit. How can we be sure? Well, let's just quickly go back to Acts, the, sorry, Genesis chapter 46. This is our last reference. You'll be very pleased to know. Um, Genesis 46. Uh, we won't do some laborious maths, but um, uh, perhaps Rebecca could verify this afterwards with her mathematical knowledge. Uh, but Genesis 46 lists um, the offspring, uh, the children, the grandchildren, the great-grandchildren of Jacob. And we can start to do some numbers, can't we? Which we're not going to do this evening. Uh, you're going to have to take my word for it, but check it when you get home if you're interested. But let's just go straight from Gen to Genesis 46, verse 26. All the souls that came with Jacob into Egypt, which came out of his loins besides Jacob's son's wives, all the souls were threescore and six, sixty-six. And of the sons of Joseph, which were born him in Egypt, were all the souls of the house of Jacob which came into Egypt were three score and ten. Seventy. So we've got sixty-six 
sons, grandsons and great-grandsons of Jacob equals 66. That's of Jacob's loins. And then to that number we add Jacob himself, says verse 27. And we add Jacob's other son, Joseph, who, by the way, was already in Egypt, and his two sons. So two, or two more of Jacob's grandsons. That's 66 plus 4 is 70. But it's of Jacob, says Genesis 46. So bear in mind the analogy, centigrade Fahrenheit. That's one perspective. That's Genesis 46. Now let's just go back to Acts 7 to, to, to sign this off. What does Acts chapter 7 do? Well, we've already laboured the point. Verses 9 to 16 is in the context of who? The fathers. It's in the context of Joseph's 11 brothers. And in that context, we're told that verse 14 of Acts 7, Joseph called, him, called unto him his... Then sent Joseph and called his father Jacob to him and all his kindred three score and fifteen souls. Then Jacob went down into Egypt and died. So the perspective is slightly different now, isn't it? Joseph is sending to call Jacob plus, we suggest, 75 others. So the actual number we're going to suggest is 76. Jacob plus Jacob's kindred, his family, if you like, his extended family, is 75. So we've got to quickly do some numbers. We've got the 66. That was Jacob's sons, grandsons and great-grandsons. We're not going to include Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh because they're already in Egypt. And we're not going to call Jacob himself because it's Jacob plus his kindred. So we've got 66. How do we get to 75? We add 9. Who could the 9 be? Genesis 46 says, not including his son's wives. Why? Because they were not directly of Jacob himself. They were his daughters-in-law. They weren't his daughters. So Genesis 46 is of Jacob's loins. Genesis uh, Acts 7 is Jacob's kindred, his extended family that wasn't already in Egypt, including his son's wives. Why then, the astute of you are asking, only nine wives? Judah's wife is dead. Simeon's wife is dead also, we believe. We'll see. We won't go to that now, but I believe I can prove that. Joseph's wife, already in Egypt. So it's perspective, isn't it? We haven't got to throw this out. We haven't got to say, well, there's got to be an error, therefore it's man's writings, uh, it can't be of God. We've got to go back to Acts 6. It's all of God. His face shone as if it were the face of an angel. He spoke with God's words. So we can't throw out these and the other so-called contradictions. We've just got to do a bit of work. And it is legwork. And I can see by some of your faces you're lost. We'll go through it afterwards. I'm happy to do it. But hopefully I've just conveyed the sense that it's not too difficult if you spend a bit of time. It's perspective. Centigrade or Fahrenheit. One's of Jacob's own loins. The other is it's Jacob and his family. Because Joseph's already there. But Joseph is still part of Jacob's family. So, so, so we'll rest the case there. Now, we've not had time this evening to consider uh, the similarities between the false accusations made against Stephen and the Lord Jesus Christ, nor to compare the way in which uh, they are put to death. Um, that would have been also very interesting. Uh, but hopefully that's been uh, an encouraging exercise, if nothing else, uh, to, to be encouraged by the word of our God, to see the things which he's left on record for our learning, and to be enthused and encouraged when we read it, a well-known passage that there might just be something that we've not spotted before. And so we can read it all again with fresh eyes. Thanks, Brother David.